guys, this video is not intended to instruct. Its purpose is entertainment. It has no warranty, either written or implied, and none shall be inferred. Hello and welcome to the show. I'll probably call this Midsummer Special 2, since I already just recently did one, which was a very short two-minute video where I shot a subsonic load I had developed into a box of sand to try to catch a particular bullet. But let's talk about subsonics. First thing is, what do we need to know about the speed of sound? Well, the first thing is, is a lot of what you heard is probably uh, sort of right. There's a lot of things that affect the speed of sound, and we often hear about it, what it is at sea level and that sort of thing. And the issue really is, is altitude does affect the speed of sound, but I think all the... Uh, Experts will agree that it's not really so much the barometric pressure, but the temperature. Being of all of the variables that affect the speed of sound, the type of gas and all that, assuming that the Earth's atmosphere hasn't really changed a whole lot, it's going to be pretty well much what it's got to be. And we talk about it being at sea level. So, class, try this at home. This won't hurt you. I went to a place called the National Weather Service, okay? Well, okay, I just typed in National Weather Service Speed of Sound Calculator. And what I'm going to do is we're going to type some numbers in here. And right before we type them in, I'm going to say this. If you see a lot of data for subsonics, you'll see the number 1050 repeat a lot. That seems to be a target uh, speed, pun intended. So we shoot for 1050, pun intended. Yeah. Okay, why do we do that instead of some other number? Well... Let's look right here on this calculator, okay? The calculator that we have will allow us to go in there and we'll just put in the temperature. Now I developed my load, now we're shooting for 1050 and it was about a 89 when I started and ended up about 96 that particular day, which is great because I always want to try to develop a subsonic load in the, the heat of the summer. Okay, so let's type in our calculator, 96 degrees, it defaults to Fahrenheit, and we'll hit the little convert, and it says that in feet per second, I can expect a, an 11.55 feet per second for the speed of sound. If I'm shooting 1050, I have to first realize I'm going to have some variation, uh, bullet to bullet, load to load, and my chronograph is really, uh, I think it's stated that it's a plus or minus 5%. And my understanding of that is that is the guaranteed accuracy that we can expect just about equal number of positives over and negatives lower so that they average pretty darn close. It's just that the device is not guaranteed anyone reading to be more uh, accurate than 5% either way. So when I shoot for 1055 in the heat of the summer, I have essentially a hundred feet per second or 10% variation that I could actually be above that. It's a cushion, you know, okay? It makes good sense. You just want to be below that and you want to be, you want to know for a fact you're going to be below that. Now, why don't we push it closer to 1100 if we got, you know, get extra 50 more feet per second out of it? Well, I guess you could do that uh, for any given load, but what we're going to do is I'm going to change this number now from 96, let's just change it to freezing, like it's just a, a, a typical freezy type uh, late uh, fall, early winter day, and it's in the morning, okay? When I change it to 32, the speed drops to 1086. So if I had decided to be kind of greedy and push it to say 1100, thinking, well, like it's a hot day, I, you know, I'm, I'm 100 feet per second below, I got 10%. I, I would have already broken it at this point in time. So at 32 degrees, 10, uh, 50 is still below the speed of sound. And if we bring it down even colder to say uh, 21 degrees, I break it to 10.74. It's still above, but it's still above, I mean, it's still above 10.50, so that looks like a good number. Now you also have a little more safety factor than that in a practical sense because there are some powders such as Hodgins 4198 and 4830, is it 4831? 
They were using the OT6 and then 322 and there's another one. They have a certain number of powders that they say are extremely accurate in various temperature ranges. But not all powders are like that. Some of them uh, get squirrely as you go up in temperature or vice versa. So what we're looking at is, do we have a good load for our, our ambient conditions? And what normally happens with a powder is, it gets slower as it gets colder. If it changes the direction at all, on average, I think you'll find that they'll get slower, not faster, in cold weather. So uh, my 1050, I actually probably will have more than 1074 uh, in actual speed of sound. There'll be a bigger difference because I won't really be 1050. I'll be something below 1050 at 21 degrees. And I'm getting kind of old. I don't like the cold weather as much. So I might not be hunting if it's 21 degrees outside. So that does affect it and they work together. So 1050, I think that's why so many people, when they do a subsonic load, they shoot for 1050 because it kind of works all over. No matter where you're at, uh, height or elevation or temperature, east coast, west coast, north or south, it's going to work most of the time. Now, if you were to start in the dead of winter and shoot for 1050, come summertime, you might actually peak above that, if that makes sense. Because it's going to grow. Most time, the powders will actually go a little bit faster the farther you go. Now, uh, you can go to like a place like Hornady.com, any number of places that have a ballistic calculator, and you can take your particular bullet, and you can put uh, the ballistic constant in there, and you can put a crosswind in it, and you can put your what your load says. And I have a, I may flash this up real quickly. This is just numbers typed in with this particular bullet, this Maker uh, 500 subsonic bullet. What uh, uh, Paul says the uh, ballistic coefficient is. I put that in there, added some information just just to see what we're doing, and we see. It actually holds its energy quite well. Now, it's still a lollipop because it's going, well, basically one-third of what a, a, a 300 wind mag does. And, you know, you're talking about 33, you know, 3,000 feet per second, 3,300. So it's going a third of the speed. Uh, gravity works the same speed per second regardless how fast your bullet goes. So you're going to get more of an arc with a slow bullet. But you maintain a pretty healthy amount of energy out of it because it's such a whopping big bullet. Before we talk about the powder, we have to kind of talk about what type of barrel you're going to shoot it out of because this is common sense kind of action going to go on here. Uh, whatever barrel length you have, it's going to go off at one end and the bullet's going to travel this end and as soon as it pops out the atmosphere because it's got no more barrel holding it, there's no more acceleration. So, if you had a long barrel, what are you going to have? You're going to have a longer opportunity to push the bullet through, say, an 18-inch barrel that you had, say, a 10.5-inch barrel. And any given condition, if I can develop, say, 1050 and, say, a 10.5-inch barrel, shooting that same load, all things being equal, which you never do that, all things being equal, shot through an inch longer, 11.5 or 12.5, I'm going to get faster. And so that's a variation. Another kind of a reason if you're making uh, subsonic loads, it kind of gives you a little bit of a cushion there. Now add it to say an 18 inch barrel or 16 inch barrel, you have even more velocity to gain. And they say approximately rule of thumb, and I don't know how you know wholesome and accurate it actually turns out to be, but they tell us that you can expect uh, 25 feet per second addition for each inch. So you can see if you go from 10 and a half to 18, that's nine, what, that's what, nine and a half inches? So nine and a half times 25, that's going to put you over the speed of sound. Now, consequently, you develop a, uh, a load for a, a regular carbine, 60 inch, and you cut it down to a short barrel rifle, it's going to drop a little bit. Now, you got give and takes with your load. The higher the pressure that's actually pushing it, that when it pops out the end of that muzzle, it's going to be a louder on a short barrel versus the long barrel. So if you really kind of want uh, the most quiet operation, it would be with a longer barrel so that you can make use of the extra speed that you're going to get out of the extra inches of barrel, which will actually let you run a lower case pressure 
because your, 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 your point is fixed, your 1050 is fixed, no matter what gun you want to shoot it out of, you want that particular setup to shoot 1050. Does that make sense to you? So that means that a short barrel is necessarily going to be louder. It may still be subsonic. You may not get the uh, crack of breaking the sound barrier, but it's actually probably going to be louder because the pressure it's going to take to push it is going to be more to get it up to speed in 10 and a half inches instead of getting up to speed in, say, 18 inches. But we can't hold that as an absolute because the powder that we use to operate these things do change and they tend to have a little sweet spot that they want to be in, and if the powder changes, the pressure changes. Now, I looked at two powder that are very, very close to each other on the speed chart, because their application is going to be about the same. I'm pushing the same bullet, it's going to be very, very close, and it's going to be H110 and a little gun. Now, what I did is I set these two up, using a volumetric equivalence. Now, normally you wouldn't do that because the powders have different characteristics, but these two are very close, and because I'm not shooting a supersonic load, I'm not going to be pushing that high end as much, and I'm a little safer. What I'm looking for is, is a good case fill. Now, when I tried the H110, what I found out is that because of the bullet length and the case volume, I actually started to compress about my second step. And when I went up two more steps uh, to the to a, my top load that I was going to shoot with that, it was a pretty hot load at that point in time. And when you compress a double base kind of uh, balls type of powder, if you kind of compress it too much, you start breaking those little balls, you start changing the uh, structure in there, the powder actually gets faster. And so your pressures will get higher. And so I topped out about 1050, a little, little bit more above 1050 on the hottest load, and I just didn't like the way the primers look. So I went to the little gun, which actually takes, for the same grain weight, it's a little more dense, takes a little less case, and so I was able to go up further. And because it's a faster burning powder, I actually needed less little gun to get the same feet per second. And it just happens that my first load, my starting load with little gun, worked out to real close to 1050 and so that's what I settled on because I gun operated everything is fine it's plenty of pressure loud enough worked fine to make me happy the question was how would it perform and so I charged them and it was fairly accurate uh, accurate enough that I adopted that load but the one other thing that I did because the 458 SOCOM has a propensity because it uses pistol primers the pistol primers are lighter, and if you go back and look at your loading data for most pistols, you'll see uh, that they're, a lot of them are around 20,000 PSI. If you look at the what is generally accepted as the pressure range for the SOCOM, it's going to be around 30, maybe 35,000 PSI, so we're higher. So if we use certain pistol primers, they're going to look like they're over pressure. Now, the one I choose to use when I'm doing a SOCOM, if I'm going to use a pistol primer, is the CCI 350. Now, I am assured uh, through expert uh, advice through the, through the company that they're actually tested to 50,000 PSI because we have rounds like, um, uh, high, high pressure rounds like 357 SIG is a high pressure round. If you look up its data, it's around 40. There's uh, other rounds that are similar to that, which are also high. 40 Smith & Wesson is a high pressure. And so that particular small, uh, large pistol magnum primer is tested to 50. It's supposed to be good to 40. But they do kind of look like they're getting flat. And with a semi-automatic uh, throwing the, the round in there, I chose, so my choice, to then also try it, test it with a large rifle primer. Now, you might think that sounds really whack, but if you look at Western Powder on their subsonics, uh, they they developed their load again with a wet, with a Winchester large rifle. I happen to use a Winchester large rifle for my uh, 270, so I have them in stock, and I just started it with my ladder building up, except that I had already predetermined I wasn't going to go above step one. And step one worked plenty, plenty fine. My primer looks good. Here's a picture of where I actually compared two very exactingly measured 
rounds one with the only thing substituted the only difference were the two primers and I'm just a margin a little hair faster with the Winchester large primer and if you want to think of it in your mind in a step uh, large magnum pistol primers are to pistol primers saying as CCI what a large rifle regular primer is to a magnum pistol primer does that make sense it's a little bit more maybe 25 30 percent more stuff because you really don't want to have a lot more primer that pushes uh, the powder before it has a chance to burn it it's a timing issue and I had a good case feel on this and I feel good about it there's you have the uh, disclaimer all my videos are disclaimer because nowadays we see that people are cracking down on how-to videos and this is not a how-to this is an entertaining video and every one of my firearm related or anything are all entertaining and of course I got way ahead of this seeing this as a possibility years ago and some people do not appreciate having to do disclaimers but there's always method to my madness welcome to the middle of the film summary both the bullet speed and speed of sound are functions of ambient temperature if the velocity gap is too small there is a chance to crack the speed of sound at either extreme of temperatures for a given powder the length of the barrel directly impacts bullet velocity. A short barrel has to be loaded higher to reach the design velocity and will run at relatively higher pressures making it louder than longer barrels. Powders differ in burn rate, energy density, chemistry, thermal characteristics, and manufacturing methods, all of which impact their suitability for application. Care and attention must be paid to percentage case fill and compression for a given bullet. Primers must be appropriate for the powder selected. The operating pressures can impact chamber pressures. Do not directly substitute primers. Always charge ladder up. Because subsonic loads typically run one half to one third of the velocity for a typical caliber of firearm, trajectory, energy, and momentum are less. This leads to less accuracy for a given distance as in-flight time is longer and wind can drift the bullets more. Additionally, there is more arch in flight. Heavy bullets are often used to counteract much of the effect. Furthermore, bullets themselves have a design velocity range which may be well above the speed of sound. Therefore, for best results, especially subsonic bullets are generally required. So, let's take a look at an actual captured subsonic Maker 500 458 bullet fired at about 1050 at the muzzle. Actually, it was 1046 is what, I, what my small batch average says I am. So. Let's take a look at that, and I'll just roll in that video about now. Here's our recovered bullet. So I turn this thing around. We'll see a little bit of brass. Do you see that right there? Looks like I got a little bit of brass there, and I'm assuming and believe it to be as um, the bullet was pushed into the case there was a little bit of edge there. I do do a chamfer inside and out just to make sure we don't have any burrs that keep it from chambering on the outside and no burrs on the inside and I don't know that this will show but there is a slight slight difference in diameter right at that point and the way we know that is because you see the lands where they cut these grooves in the bullet, you see, they stop. So the only way they're going to stop is if this is slightly, ever so slightly smaller diameter than the main shank of the bullet. Same way with like this uh, pressure reliever right here. It gives a place for the uh, copper to flow when it's fired. We'll spin this around. And we see that little bit of black soot right here and I happen to notice that the groove depth is quite high here right here or deep rather I should say these grooves are fairly deep and I got some sooting on one side of that bullet some brass on one side of the bullet if I spin it on to this side to that one that impression is very shallow compared to these on this side. In fact, what you actually see is 
an extra little gouge right there next to that land uh, where the land made that groove into the bullet okay so it's deep on that side and very shallow right there and now again I'm getting I have some sitting on that one side now my belief is is this bullet didn't perfectly center in the, in the uh, barrel and it's hard to believe that the bullet is not perfectly round because it's actually turned or manufactured uh, cut bullet cut from a piece of copper so I believe the bullet to be round I believe the barrel to be round I think what we see here is that the, that the bullet when it jumps out of the case it being fired it actually goes down the barrel and if it's a little off centered when it hits on this side it just goes ahead and strips this little groove right in it and it takes it takes all the pressure off of it and if there's no pressure on this because it cut this side then there's really no pressure on that side of the bullet to do the cutting on that so it just it bullet just doesn't get perfectly centered in, in the barrel i don't believe now let's look at the front end of it it's a pretty wicked looking um, mushroom i guess you would call it see a little bit of a little bit of stuff there still in a little bit of sand i guess that is But overall, that's what your bullet looks like after it's been fired. It's got a little baby cup on that side. Don't really know why. Probably to, to hold it in a machining process. But there you go. You got a good. You get a good view. Um, let me move that back toward the center. You get a good view of of the grooves as they get as they're cut by the lands. So that's the bullet. Let's take a look at a, at a fired case. Now one of the things I look, of course, let me see if I can turn this around. This happens to be the, the Winchester Large Rifle Primer. And it was ladder tested. You, see, you still see that it's got plenty of good roundness on this. And Western Powder has uh, information on their powder for recipes. And every one of those uses a Winchester long rifle, uh, Winchester rifle primer. Um, I think the, the kind of the standard for this happens to be a, a Magnum pistol primer, but the cups are a little bit thinner and they tend to pop on uh, fairly high loads if you happen to get that way. So I think I've got a decent load developed here. Let me pull that back into frame. I haven't polished this brass. Part of the purpose of using virgin brass is that you can tell if you're getting how much soot is being deposited, like you're having blow pack, like if you're having pressure come back around trying to work its way on the back side of the chamber, you would know that. And it looks fairly clean. So I don't think I have extraordinarily high pressure, and I think I have a fairly tight chamber. The barrel this was shot in is a Tromex, and if I look on, let's just put that right here. Spin this. If I can figure out how to hold it, see there's really no, no gouges or anything in the case. So I'd say the I'd say the gun is operating properly. I'd say it's not overly pressurized. And I think we're doing pretty good shape.